so we're going to be in Luke chapter 2 as we're continuing our walk through the book of Luke. So Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40 this morning. So Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. Let's hear God's word together now. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. As it, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit in the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fa with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for our time together this morning. Thank you for your word, and I pray that you'd help us, uh, help me as I preach, and help all of us to hear and understand what you have for us today. And we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, Christmas has come and gone once again. Uh, of course, we're still in the Christmas season, like we talked about a few minutes ago. It goes from December 25th to January 6th. Uh, but most folks, uh, in terms of day-to-day -day activities at least, have moved on. Uh, these post-Christmas days typically, for most people, form a rhythm of their own as well, right? If you think about it, so we take down the Christmas tree and all the other decorations and put them back up in the attic, uh, we haul a bunch of stuff that we no longer need or that, frankly, we just don't want to keep presents that we're giving to us. We take those to Goodwill. Uh, we, we join the gym. Uh, if we're in the business world, we begin thinking in earnest about first quarter goals. Uh, it, it's after Christmas, and there are things to be done. Well, our passage today takes us back to that very first after Christmas. And while we don't know everything that Mary and Joseph did in those first few weeks following the birth of their boy, Luke does give us a glimpse. And so today, as we continue our walk through Luke's gospel, we're going to see what happened just a few weeks after Jesus' birth during his first trip to the temple at Jerusalem. And so let's break down our time like this this morning, just two headings, uh, Simeon and the consolation of Israel and Anna and the redemption of Jerusalem. Okay, so Simeon and the consolation of Israel, Anna and the redemption of Jerusalem. So let's jump in first with Simeon and the consolation of Israel. Uh, I am from a really, really small town, as in no stoplights in my town. And uh, one of the characteristics that I guess probably marks out all small towns, um, certainly does mine, is how conversations about people usually go. And I'm not talking about gossip here. I'm just, well, let me explain what I mean. Uh, let's say that you and I, you're from my small town. Let's say we're talking about... Uh, Bobby. I don't know, we'll call the guy Bobby. And Bobby recently had a bad car wreck. Now, news like that travels like wildfire around a small town. And so I'm telling you about Bobby, 
uh, if I'm talking to you about him, uh, especially if by some miracle you don't know him very well, because everybody knows everybody in small town, of course. But if you don't, there's a pretty good chance that I'm going to start talking after I've talked about Bobby for a minute. I'm going to try to help orient you. I'm going to start talking more about his family and his parents in particular. And I'll say something like, oh, you know, that's Jimmy and Sue's boy. Uh, you know, Jimmy, he worked out there at the aluminum plant for like 30 years. Sue, she's got diabetes, you know, and she lost her foot last year. Uh, and the next thing you know, you have this entire dossier on Jimmy and Sue, even though Bobby is the point of the story. By the way, that scenario I relived at least 10 times over the last week. Um, <clears throat> Luke does something very similar in this passage. This comes on the heels of Luke telling us about tell us that Mary and Joseph have circumcised Jesus according to the Jewish law. Okay, Jesus is the point of the story, but Luke backs up and talks to us for a moment here about Joseph and Mary. Look at verses 22 through 24. Okay, verses 22 through 24. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, flip over to verse 39. <clears throat> and when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Okay, so why does Luke go into such detail about the law in these verses? He mentions it a couple of times there. Well, for one thing, he probably wanted to commend Mary and Joseph. Okay, showing uh, that they are committed to following God's Word. I mean, they're, they're held up, and we see them both in Luke's narrative and over in Matthew as well as, as God-honoring uh, people, and he reiterates that well. But, but there's something else that's going on also. Remember, we've talked about this several times so far uh, in our walk through Luke, that his overarching purpose is to show how God's unfolding rescue plan Okay, that we see from the very beginning of Genesis, how that unfolds and reaches its culmination in the person and work of Jesus. So way back in Genesis 12, God had told Abram, later Abraham, that he would give him countless descendants. He, he told Abram that he would bless them, and that he would make them a conduit of blessing to all the families of the earth. So Abraham's descendants... Uh, through his son Isaac and grandson Jacob, would come to be known as the people of Israel, the Jewish people. Throughout their history, God continues to reiterate his promise to send them a rescuer and continue telling them and showing them that he does love them, that he will be with them no matter what. And so God's plan with them has been working itself out uh, from the time that they became a particular nation after the exodus from Egypt. So at Mount Sinai, uh, God gives Israel a law to live by, rules that would govern their conduct as their individual and corporate lives unfolded. Of course, did people do a good job of that? Nah, huh? They, they didn't obey that law very long at all and certainly with nothing like wholehearted devotion. As a Jew, those were the rules that Jesus would live by as well. But he was different. He did obey those laws, all of them, perfectly, in thought, word, and action. He did that to stand in the place of those who didn't as their substitute. See, Luke is showing us that from the very beginning, even when Jesus is nothing more than a passive participant, his life is marked by perfect obedience to, perfect conformity to God's law, his word. As Paul says in Galatians 4, Quote, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You see, Jesus didn't exempt himself from normal, faithful obedience when he came. To paraphrase Dorothy Sayers, he played by the same rules he laid down for everybody else. All right? He came to relate to his people in every way, yet without sin. See, he came to save people who were law breakers, who were often faithless to God's word. See, he would be the law keeper, 
faithful in every way in their place. That's what we talk about when we talk about Jesus being our substitute. He's not only our substitute in his death, but also in the life that he lived on our behalf. Now, back to the specifics of the text. Uh, Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem, so that's about six miles from Bethlehem, to undergo, quote, purification according to the law of Moses. Now, the law mandated that when a woman gave birth to a son, that she was ceremonially unclean for 40 days, uh, at the end of which time she was to offer a sacrifice at the temple. Now, technically, Joseph didn't have to be a part of this process. So remember I said a couple of weeks ago that when Joseph went to Bethlehem to be registered for the census, that Mary technically didn't have to be a part of that, but she went along. Same kind of thing here. Joseph didn't technically, according to law, have to be a part of this process. But of course, he's going to go with his wife, support her. He's with her during this time as well. Now, the law said that the offering was to be a lamb and a pigeon. Okay, that would not have been a, a cheap offering necessarily. So for the poor, uh, the law gave a stipulation that there could be a substitute offering made, one that, that was more affordable, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So that may indicate that Mary and Joseph are a poor young couple. Uh, historic records show that by that point in history, most people may have just made this offering. Uh, but it's probably indicative of the fact that they're from Nazareth, the backwoods of nowhere, and they're just getting started in life. They're poor. Again, God doesn't reserve his work for or through the rich or the powerful or the qualified. That's a theme we're going to see come up over and over again throughout Luke, that God uses all kinds of people. That ought to give us all a lot of hope, all kinds of people to accomplish his purpose. So while they're still in the temple, uh, they would have been in the court of women or the court of Gentiles, since those are the only two places that Mary could be in the temple, uh, something unexpected happens. Look, look at verses 25 through 28. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Okay, pause the tape. So Luke introduces the next character in the drama surrounding Jesus' birth, a man named Simeon. Uh, he tells us, quote, this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, that's a really, really important phrase that I want to hone in on for a moment. Uh, the word for consolation is used in the Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament. We've talked about this before, so the Old Testament's originally written in Hebrew. Then it was translated into Greek. That's known as the Septuagint. So that word for consolation is used in the Greek version of the Old Testament a number of times, specifically in the book of Isaiah. The reason that's important is Isaiah is known by scholars and has been for a long time. Uh, some scholars call it the fifth gospel because it tells us so much about the, the life, the death, the resurrection of the coming uh, Redeemer, the Messiah, Jesus, and what he would do. In those passages, in Isaiah, God is talking about how he's going to rescue and show compassion to his people, how he's going to comfort them. That's what consolation means. So Isaiah 40, verse 1 says this, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. So it's that same word for consolation. Isaiah 49, 13, sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth, break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted, same word, his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. Now, isn't that interesting that the book that talks the most in the Old Testament about the coming of the rescuer is also the book that makes such frequent use of this word for consolation? the very thing that Simeon was waiting on. You see that, how that connection comes together? See, Simeon's life is defined by waiting on God to bring these promises to fulfillment. In God's kindness, the Spirit was upon him, the text tells us. Uh, Luke then tells us what the Spirit's doing in Simeon's life. He's revealing to him that he was going to see the Messiah, the consolation that he'd been waiting on, and then he takes him to the temple that day to see this consolation in the flesh, the flesh of a newborn baby. 
And that brings us back to the temple. Simeon sees baby Jesus, walks up, takes him into his arms. I mean, that would have been a shock. Like this day and age, Simeon's getting arrested for doing that, okay? Like, but you can imagine what kind of a shock that would have been, right? This, this old man just walks up out of the crowd and grabs your baby. Uh, and then he begins to bless God, to praise him. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Uh, church history knows this little section as the nuke dimittis, which is the Latin phrase for now dismiss. So it's from the very first part of that prayer or that blessing, if you look at what Simeon says. Uh, Simeon sees this boy and he knows he's seen God's salvation. He's seen the consolation of Israel. He's holding the consolation of Israel. And so now he can leave and die in peace, knowing that things will be set right, knowing that God has kept his promise. And I want you to notice how Simeon describes this. Okay, during Advent, uh, I noted that when Mary and Zechariah and the angels who talked to shepherds talked about God's promises being fulfilled, the focus was upon him keeping his promises to who? Israel, right? Like that's, that's the focus. Now, there were hints that God's rescue plan also included the Gentiles, just as there were in the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah's significance. But those notes were being played softly, kind of in the background, okay, they were for, for the meantime. But here, God's love for both groups takes center stage. Notice, salvation you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people, Israel. Salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, so non-Jewish people. He's saying we're going to know God's salvation as well through Jesus. See, Jesus is God's word in the flesh, the revel of God's character and his intention to all peoples, all tribes, all languages. That's a favorite theme we're going to see throughout Luke's writings, both in Luke and in Acts, which is appropriate since Luke is what? He's a Gentile, right? God's mission is worldwide. In fact, we're a testament to that reality here today, right? Think about all the, the ethnic, linguistic, tribal uh, backgrounds we all come from, okay? I mean, if we did a 23 in May right now, almost every nation on earth will be represented in just this room to some extent or another. See, like, that's a fulfillment of what gets said right here. You see that? But this salvation would come through the Jewish people. It says, for glory to your people Israel. So God used them to bring the Messiah into the world and be the first to preach the gospel and the first to establish churches. And he's continued to bring Jewish people to faith throughout the generations. Their scriptures, their history, their suffering, they would be vindicated through the coming of the long-promised, long-hoped-for Messiah. See, Jew or Gentile, Simeon is telling us the hope of the world is found in Jesus. It's found in Jesus, y'all. That's it. No other candidates, no other hope. One game in town is Jesus and what he's done for us. Over uh, And once again, uh, Mary and Joseph find their heads spinning. Verse 33, and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. See, every time they think they've heard it all, something else happens. So verse 34 uh, tells us that he blesses Joseph and Mary, but then he turns his attention especially to mom. Verses 34 and 35. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul as well, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now, so far from the angel who visited Mary uh, to Elizabeth to, uh, to Zechariah, all these people, to the angels, to the shepherds, to Simeon's initial blessing, everything's been positive about Jesus up to this point, right? Everything has been positive. But now we get the first hint that there's trouble coming. Jesus would be the great dividing line in people's hearts. Some would embrace him, others would reject him. Uh, during his ministry, Matthew 10, Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Those are hard words. Like you don't typically see those stitched on a pillow or on a mug, right? You don't see that, but that, that's what's being said here. Yes, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But he wasn't universally loved and followed then, just like he's not now. And that causes a divide, even to the level of family, even to the level of our own hearts, as he says in that passage. But, but he also notes in that Matthew passage that losing our lives, in other words, giving up control of our lives for his sake, is where we find true life. And true joy. And for Mary, it says a sword would pierce her soul. Now that word for sword in the Greek is a term for a broad sword, a big sword. Mary would experience the pain of loving her boy who would be so often hated and maligned. A boy she couldn't entirely comprehend. A boy who would end up on a Roman cross, though he was heralded as the hope of Israel since before his birth. Mary's life shows us, among other things, that serving God is not an inoculation against hardship. It's not. God promises that one day He will wipe away every tear from every eye, but this side of glory, things are really, really hard sometimes. Even when we love God, even when we follow Jesus, but as Mary would tell us, and as Jesus did tell us, it's worth it because He's our Redeemer. He's our Rescuer. And that takes us to our next point, Anna and the redemption of Jerusalem. Uh, as some of y'all know, I office uh, out of a local coffee shop right down the street. I'm there 20, 30 hours a week, sometimes more, uh, usually sitting at the same spot. I pay one flat fee per year, uh, which buys me hot tea every day. So I'm good to go. Uh, more times than I can count, in fact, I had this happen to me the day that we left town uh, a couple weeks ago, I've had people walk up to me Sometimes people I don't even know. And they'll say to me, do you ever leave here? And I always tell them I'm like Quasimodo in the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I just wander around the rafters at night. Um, well, Luke tells us that the, the temple in Jerusalem had a similar character, Anna, verses 36 and 37. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting, uh, with fasting and prayer, night and day. Uh, Luke tells us first that she's a prophetess. So several women in the Old Testament are called prophetesses. For instance, uh, Moses' sister, Miriam, and later Deborah, who was also a judge of Israel. Uh, they were vehicles of God's revelation to His people, just as the prophets uh, like Samuel, Elijah, and Isaiah had been. So Luke's letting us know right off the bat that God is about to speak through Anna. He's about to use her in a particular uh, redemptive way. Now, depending upon how we take the, the Greek, the text might say that uh, she was an 84-year-old widow, uh, or it might say that she has been a widow for 84 years. And if she was 12 or 13 when she was married, which was common uh, then, and then widowed as a 19 or 20-year-old, uh, she would be about 104 years old at this point. Either way, she is an elderly lady. She's not buying right or you know green bananas. Uh, Luke tells us that quote she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. Okay, now that's not meant to be taken literally. Uh, there weren't beds for old ladies to sleep at the temple. Uh, or rather, like me at the coffee shop, she was there all the time. That's what's being said. Uh, this was her life worshiping God, fasting, praying. See, her old age has not sapped her hunger for God. And that brings up a really important point. I'm going to pull off the highway just for a second on this. Now, I know this is not the primary burden of this passage, but it's something that we need to see and I need to say nonetheless. Um, both Simeon and Anna are old. Okay, we, we know 
Anna is, the text says so, and it looks like Simeon is too by the context of what he says. But, but that doesn't stop them from hoping in God's promises, from, from serving Him, from staying active and alert. They're still in the game. And the crescendo of both of their lives is going to take place that day, that day as elderly people. Beloved, I've known a lot of senior saints and a lot, a lot of older Christians, and frankly, uh, not all of them have finished well. Most haven't, in fact. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. Most have not finished well. Uh, they stop serving. They stop trying to grow in their faith. They stop pouring into younger believers. They stop reveling in God's promises. They're just kind of marking time till they die. It is so sad, and it is crippling churches all over this country. It is crippling churches all over this country. If that's you, if you're doing that, and your heart knows, um, do you realize what you're cheating your brothers and sisters in the faith out of when you do that? You realize what you're doing? You're robbing us. I mean, I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. You're robbing, so I'm going to say us. You're robbing us of experience and perspective that we cannot possibly have right now. You're taking it and you're keeping it. You're putting it under a bushel. Okay? Um, do you realize what you're cheating yourself out of? You take yourself out of the game, out of the flow of, of the church's life. Okay? Do you realize how you're squandering the gifts that God's given you, gifts you're still going to be responsible for when you stand before God one day? He's going to ask, how'd you use those last 10 years? How'd you use those last five years? And I was old and I didn't feel like it is not an excuse. And it will never be an excuse for any of the rest of us as we age either. Please remember this sermon. Remember what I'm saying right now. I've been a pastor for 20 years. I've seen this more times than I can count. Don't, don't be that person. Don't be that person. This is not the time to back down. Please don't. Um, how you serve may look different depending upon health or life circumstances, etc. But that's the case with everybody. You may not always serve in the same roles. You may go at a different pace. The point is to stay in the game. Keep proactively following Jesus, beloved. The church needs you. The church needs you. And I hope this passage encourages you to that end. Okay, back to Anna. Luke gives us another interesting biographical tidbit. She is, quote, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Uh, back in the Old Testament, uh, after the reign of King Solomon, David's son, the nation of Israel undergoes a massive fracture. So the northern kingdom is comprised into 10 of Israel's 12 tribes, and they were known simply as Israel. So they had their own line of kings, their own center of worship in Samaria, and most of the historic Israelite territory. The southern kingdom uh, was comprised of Judah and then the little tribe of Benjamin, and they were centered around Jerusalem and the south. Okay, they had their own line of kings, their own center of worship in Jerusalem. So in 722 and 721 B.C., the Assyrians sweep in and conquer Israel, sending its inhabitants into exile, scattering them all over the Mediterranean world. Those tribes eventually intermarried with the locals, and they were lost to history, at least for the most part. Asher was one of those tribes, one of those ten tribes. And yet, here is Anna, not merely of the tribe of Asher, but a member of Asher who is a vehicle of God's revelation right here. New Testament scholars Andreas Kostenberger and Alexander Stewart uh, have noted that her presence there as a member of the tribe of Asher is sort of a preview of this redemption, of this rescue, of God's ancient promise to restore Israel, even those lost tribes, through Jesus. And I think they're right there. In God's use of Anna, he's showing that through Jesus, he'll bring the rescue, the redemption that the Jewish people were desperate for, even those who've been scattered to the ends of the earth by that point. And fittingly, that's the very message on Anna's lips. Verse 38, she never, never actually quotes Anna, but it tells us kind of third hand what she's saying. And coming up at that very hour, she, begins to get, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him 
to all who are waiting for the, what's it say? The redemption, okay, or rescue of Jerusalem. By the time we get to the first century, Israel had been under more or less constant occupation or oppression uh, for between six and 700 years. Uh, now they're under the dominion of the most powerful empire the world had ever seen. Uh, though they have a degree of freedom uh, at the hands of the Romans, they are by no means free people. The prophets hadn't spoken in almost 500 years, and for all appearances, God had forgotten them. But there were still many who hoped in His ancient promise of rescue, of salvation. They were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And for those who were still hoping, still hoping that God would come through, Anna's telling them, the Redeemer, the one who will save us, is here. God has kept His promise to us. And upon hearing those words and, and no doubt soaking them up, the text tells us that Mary and Joseph head back home to Nazareth. Now, the narrative ends by reminding us this baby boy, the hope of all the world, had truly become one of us, just like when we read the Nicene Creed earlier. It highlights that. Okay, look at verse 40. And the child grew and became strong, just like any healthy child does. Imagine the creator of heaven and earth had to learn to eat solids. He learned how to walk and talk. He learned bowel and bladder control. He learned the Shema, the Jewish profession of faith from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And yet, there's something more. He was, quote, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. In fact, he was, as we've already seen and as we will see, God in the flesh, God with us, Emmanuel. We close up, I just want to point, point you back to the text one more time. Uh, you may have noticed a verb that came up in both parts of this passage that we read. A particular verb. I'll let you look for a second, see if you can find it. The verb waiting. Waiting. Uh, Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Anna and her hearers were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. They weren't just marking time, looking at their watches. That's what we think of, right, when we use the word waiting. That's typically how we use it. No, 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 no. That's not what's going on here. They were proactively looking forward to God fulfilling His Word. They were proactively looking forward. That's the way the Bible uses the word wait most of the time. They were waiting for God to rescue His people. And with the coming of Jesus, that salvation was at hand. Uh, they knew that, as Luke makes clear, but they didn't know how God was going to do that. I mean, they knew Jesus was their hope and their Savior, but they didn't know the details. They didn't realize the extent of the salvation that He would accomplish. They didn't realize that Jesus came first and foremost to save them from their sins. See, He came to live as their substitute, as we discussed at the beginning of our message, and He came to die as their substitute facing the justice that they deserve for their sins. In fact, He did that for everyone who will trust Him, Jew or Gentile. He is the Savior of the world, the rescuer of people like you and me. He came for us, beloved, and He's calling us to trust in Him today. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I ask you uh, today that you would help us to trust in Jesus. And Lord, uh, we are in, still in this world, even as people that trust in Jesus, there's just a lot of hardship and a lot of difficulty. And so we find ourselves waiting too, uh, waiting for the day that uh, you will make all the sad things come untrue. So Father, please give us grace to wait well, to look to the Lord Jesus with confidence, uh, not because we are such great people, but because the Holy Spirit is empowering us to wait well. So help us. Help us, we ask now, as we get ready to launch into a new year. Help us, we pray. Amen.